Good morning again. Could you please take your seats? We need to start. Good morning. I'm pleased to welcome you all to the 2023 Youth Forum of the Economic and Social Council, and I call to order this first meeting. Please take your seats. Before proceeding to hear opening statements, I invite participants to view an introductory video of the 2023 Youth Forum. Please play the video. Dear world. Dear world. Dear world. Dear world. Dear world. Dear world. When you turn on the news in your home or office, young people are there. We are an integral part of the very fabric of human society. We're directly influenced by everything that happens around us. And we directly influence everything that happens around you. We work. We participate. We demonstrate. We seek refuge. We capture. We build peace. We help. We learn. We teach. We care. We heal. We worry. We celebrate. We innovate. Youth can be a part of the work towards a better world. The voices of young leaders will once again echo in the chambers of the United Nations in New York. A chance to interact with policy makers on the issues that young people are specifically affected by. And brainstorm on how youth can take action to implement the 2030 development agenda. Young people are the present as much as they are the future. As as they are the future. The future. The future. The future. Dear youth representatives, honorable ministers, excellencies, distinguished delegates and friends joining us in person and online. Welcome to the 2023 Economic and Social uh, Council Youth Forum. It is great to see the chamber once again full of energy, enthusiasm and commitment and only, uh, that only young people can bring. The COVID-19 pandemic may have impacted our in-person meetings, but not the determination of all of you, young leaders from around the world, to continue your valuable engagement in the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. The Youth Forum takes place during a time of conflict, compounding economic and social crisis, global insecurity, the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic, and the disastrous effects of climate change. The world we live in today feels less safe and less equal. Young people have been uniquely burdened by the recent shocks and crises in ways that far surpass what we had initially thought. Youth unemployment is at an all-time high. Disruptions to education and skills training are rampant throughout the world. Young people in the least developed countries and small island developing states are particularly impacted by climate-related disasters. 
the Youth Forum comes at a pivotal moment for all of us. We are at the midpoint of our commitment to reach the Sustainable Development Goals and the 2030 Agenda. We have only seven years left. This year's theme, accelerating the COVID-19 recovery and full implementation of the 2030 Agenda with and for youth means that you play a key role in shaping our future. We're looking forward to your ideas, recommendations and solutions for a better, more peaceful and more sustainable tomorrow on SDG 6, clean water and sanitation, SDG 7, affordable and clean energy, SDG 9, industry, innovation and infrastructure, SDG 11, sustainable cities and communities, and SDG 17, partnership for the goals. During the next three days, you will have the opportunity to discuss, exchange views, network, and advance accountability to the commitments and promise we set forth in 2015. Your participation, insights, wisdom, and unique experiences are critical to the debates, discussions, and outputs of the ECOSOC Youth Forum, the high-level political forum uh, that we're going to uh, hold in July, and the SDG Summit in September. The priorities that you would identify during the next three days will help us to determine key actions for the successful implementation of the 2030 Agenda and strengthen commitments to the meaningful youth engagement in the work of the United Nations. What we need is immediate, bold and transformative action to reverse course and redirect our energy on accelerating the SDG implementation for and with young people. What is expected of us is to uplift and amplify youth voices around the world. What we need are opportunities for young people to come together and share their visions for change and impactful action. This is what the Youth Forum represents. It is an opportunity, a space for profound and genuine action driven and influenced by you, the youth of the world. It is a platform to listen, to listen to the voices of the current and future generations, to listen to the voices of those who will not be overlooked anymore. We need you to guide us and to be part of the decision-making processes that will affect the future. We are inviting you to be candid in your discussions, especially on the third day of the forum, as together we will advance key messages and recommendations as inputs to the preparatory process of the SDG Summit. I also welcome the participation of ministers, senior officials, and youth delegates to the forum. Use the forum for informal exchanges and other, with other youth leaders. Dear friends, the Economic and Social Council will be home for the, uh, your home for the next three days. I can assure you that we hear you, we value you, and we are eager to learn from you. Let's shape together the world we wish to live in and the future you deserve. Welcome to the 2023 Youth Forum. I now invite the president of the 77th session of the General Assembly, His Excellency Chabo Koroshi, to address the forum. Thank you much, Madam President. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, leaders of today and leaders of tomorrow, welcome to this chamber. Welcome to the United Nations. As young people today, you are warriors. We regard you as warriors. You are making your mark in a world, as we heard from the president, overcome by complex intelling crises that have been supercharged by the COVID pandemic. You are fighting for your lives your families, your communities, and our planet. You're fighting superior odds with little more than your voice, your phones, your social media accounts and activities, and your enthusiasm. And yet, despite it all, you are winning. You are winning already by being here, being involved, and being heard. And I hope being listened. 
to give you a few examples of how your engagement is making a difference. Just last month, the UN General Assembly passed by consensus a resolution requesting the International Court of Justice to issue an advisory opinion on the legal obligations regarding climate change. It has been a long battle for more than 10 years, and the last four years turned to be decisive. This was a historic moment inspired by young law students from the Pacific, who in 2019 raised their concern uh, to the attention of Vanuatu's government. The rest is history. There are other examples. In Ghana, young climate activist Joshua Mponsam founded the Green Africa uh, Youth Organization. It led to the first community-led zero waste program in West Africa, the Sustainable Community Project. It led to the first community-led zero waste program in West Africa, let me repeat. I saw similar projects in India as well. The project has been replicated across municipalities, provided jobs to more than 100 people and restored dignity to the, uh, to the work of informal waste collectors. This is proof that you can be drivers of real transformation, that your commitment your thoughts and innovations may prove to be game-changing. Young people's ideas are critical because our 2030 agenda for sustainable development is badly off track. This is a perfect opportunity to come up with some game-changing solutions on several SDGs that will be under review of our high-level political forum in July, as we heard from the, uh, from the president of the ECOSOC. We just concluded the UN Voter Conference. We emerged uh, in a voter action agenda containing more than 700 voluntary commitments and nine game-changer ideas. Many of these would not have been born and accepted without your dedication, your energy, and your thirst to do things. But now we have them. And now we are going to change the course of event. Thank you very much. Dear friends, <clears throat> we have reached tipping points, points of no return. And in a sense, a moment of truth has come. We cannot accept any more excuses for delaying the implementation of the pledges my generation has made. I cannot see anything that would be more urgent than to reverse at least some of the human-induced damage to our natural resources, to our planet, the only home we have. Keep this in mind. Educate yourself and hold leaders accountable for promises made. You will soon have a good partner on your side. The new UN uh, Youth Office is taking shape. And once established, this will guarantee that your voices are systematically in integrated across the United Nations system. Now is the time to share your perspectives. Because now is the time to transform our practices, the way we live and the way we think about it. We are the last, uh, the, uh, the first generation of feeling the really, really very bad shape of climate, water, biodiversity, and we are the last generation who can still do something about it. I have to tell you, it will not be an easy progress or smooth sailing. But if you feel stuck, remember what Jordan Sparks sang. 
we live and we learn to take one step at a time. I thank you and welcome on board. I thank the President of the General Assembly for his statement, and I now invite the forum to hear a statement by the Secretary General of the United Nations, His Excellency Antonio Guterres. It will be via video message. Excellencies, colleagues, dear friends, welcome to this forum, especially the young people gathered here. My message to you is simple. Our world needs you more than ever. From climate change, to conflicts, to poverty and inequalities, to the fact that the Sustainable Development Goals are slipping out of reach. Developing solutions to these challenges side by side with young people is the driving force of this forum's discussion. It is the reason behind the new UN Youth Office that will be fully operational this year. And it's at the heart of the UN policy brief launched last week on meaningful youth participation. The brief response to what young people have been telling us for years, that you feel ignored by decision makers even when you are at the table, and that you are left out of the decisions that affect you the most. The policy brief puts forward three core recommendations. First, it calls on governments to expand and strengthen youth participation at all levels of decision making. That includes establishing a dedicated youth consultation mechanism in every country in the world and the global standard on meaningful youth participation. Second, it calls on member states to ensure that youth engagement is at the heart of UN decision-making processes and to strengthen critical avenues for youth participation, including this ECOSOC Youth Forum. And third, it calls for the establishment of a standing UN Youth Town Hall process and other measures to ensure diverse, effective, and representative youth participation across all that we do. At the same time, we need young people to lend their energies, ideas, innovations, and talents in the preparations for September's SDG Summit. The summit must become a turning point in the race towards the SDGs. The world is counting on leaders to arrive with concrete commitments, and this includes clear ambition on tackling poverty and inequality, as well as support for a massive stimulus package to ensure that all countries, not just those with the biggest checkbooks, can invest in SDG progress. So today, I urge you to stand up for the SDGs. Activate your peers, families, and communities. Let's shape a better future. Let's do it together. I thank the Secretary General for the statement, and I now invite the Secretary General's envoy on youth, Ms. Jayatma Vikramanayake, to address the forum. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam President. Uh, first, allow me to express my solidarity with the young people around the world, especially in Sudan, Afghanistan, Ukraine, and many other places um, who become victims of conflicts that they did not create, yet continue to be resilient um, in the face of crisis. Dear colleagues, dear young people, welcome to the Kasuk Youth Forum of 2023. As many of you know that um, I've been on parental leave for the last five months and this time spent together with my family since becoming a new mother has um, no doubt reinvigorated my energy and my determination to continue fighting for a world where all young people have a say in decisions that affect their lives, their bodies and their communities and our world as a whole. So even though if there is a little bit more um, of time for me to officially return back to work, this is why I decided to break my maternity leave here to briefly be with all of you to mark this historic moment. This is a historic moment uh, because after three challenging years of battling the COVID-19 pandemic, we are extremely thrilled to presume our in-person youth forum now in an innovative hybrid format. We have over 800 young people here at the UN headquarters. Some of you are in the room, some of you are in the overflow room, and some of you are watching us online, including gatherings at UN houses in various countries, in Benin, El Salvador, Mozambique, North Macedonia, South Sudan, and in 
in many other UN country teams. There are watch parties being held right now. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you who are watching online and welcome uh, to the ECOSOC Youth Forum. I'm also pleased to welcome a number of ministers, vice ministers, state secretaries, young parliamentarians, ambassadors, and many other high-level government officials and representatives to this gathering. This year, as the president of ECOSOC said, the Youth Forum unfolds against a backdrop of complex global issues, including escalating geopolitical tensions, a relentless climate crisis, and persistent poverty around the world. To address these challenges, we have repeatedly heard that the world needs more solidarity, more cooperation, and more meaningful engagement of stakeholders. This is especially true for young people who are often most left behind, excluded, and marginalized. We have the responsibility to create a world that is peaceful, just, sustainable, and equitable, leaving no one behind, as envisioned in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. In the seven years we have left, we must ensure that all young people are empowered to reach their full potential, that they all have access to resources and can contribute to decision-making at all levels, alongside their governments, alongside other stakeholders, as equal partners, not mere beneficiaries. Over the last few years, the UN has taken important steps in that direction. In 2018, the Secretary General launched the first ever UN system-wide youth strategy, Youth 2030, bringing together 131 UN country teams and 50 UN entities to enhance the UN's work with and for youth. And as you have seen in the past four years, we've made steady progress in the ways that the UN engages with young people at various levels and the number of young people that we involve with in various levels from country to region to global level. Last year, the General Assembly adopted by consensus a historic resolution on the establishment of the UN Youth Office, recognizing the important role young people play in multilateral system and ensuring institutional space and resources to amplify the work done by my office thus far. And just last week, the Secretary General, as he shared earlier, launched a policy brief outlining key proposals on the action needed to strengthen meaningful, diverse, and effective youth participation in intergovernmental policy making and decision making at all levels here at the United Nations. As we embark on three days of in-depth discussion, I urge the decision makers, the ministers, the vice ministers, the high-level government representatives in this room to keep the spirit of these ambitious recommendations proposed by the Secretary General in mind and strive for concrete commitments and concrete action to deliver on young people's demands. I also urge every young person in the room and outside to join forces, utilizing your leadership to elevate and champion the diverse voices and concerns of young people in all their diversity who might or might not be with us in this room. In the words of Wangari Maathai, the first African woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize, in the course of history, there comes a time when humanity is called to shift to a new level of consciousness, to a higher moral ground, a time when we have to shed our fear and give hope to each other. And the time is now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jayatma, for your statement and for being here with us today. And I now invite Mr. Javani Kendry, member of the United Nations Secretary General Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change, to address the forum. Thank you, Madam President, ministers, excellencies, fellow youth leaders, ladies and gentlemen. I come from a region where roughly 10 years ago, on the eve of Christmas, Santa's gift to my island home, St. Lucia, and many other small island states in the Eastern Caribbean was that of torrential wind, widespread flooding, severe winds, leading to massive infrastructural damage, and sadly, loss of many lives. 
up to this day, some of us are yet to fully recover, either from the psychological trauma or economic losses. As this was an out-of-season event, it was an eye-opener to us that life as we knew it in what we normally call our paradise islands was no longer said to be the same. It was clear that climate change came uninvited to our doorsteps, breaking all doors on its way in. This was my trigger as a teenager in wanting to do something, and which is why 2015 was seen as a year of hope for us. You know, not only with the Paris Agreement, which remains crucial for the survival of our small island developing states, but also the adoption of the 2030 Agenda, which is meant to be that blueprint towards achieving a better future for all. Now, let's be frank, that despite this clear guide on what needs to be done, we are still lagging behind on achieving many of these goals. And guess who is and will suffer the most? You, me, and future generations. So then, I am still yet to understand why instead of stronger global partnerships, we keep seeing increasing division among nations. Without peace, we simply cannot have a just and equitable world. We have nearly wasted the past decade talking about sustainability, but not truly really walking to sustainability. So I am here today not to bore you repeating all the challenges and so on. You know it, we feel it, but rather highlight that we have a rapidly closing window of opportunity and a catalyst to accelerate progress post COVID-19 and to build back better. We saw how during the pandemic that it inspired innovation among young people, coming up with solutions to keep us connected and new enterprises. In this post-COVID-19 era, COVID era, we cannot allow the creation of a cemetery of youth ideas, which will put the 2030 agenda in jeopardy. The entrepreneurial spirit of this generation and our capacity to take forward an idea from paper to reality in the right enabling environment is unmatched. But the question is again, how do we support perhaps a young African innovator who wants to use AI to improve water access in his area? Or perhaps a Latin American or Pacific Islander who wants to scale up use of their solar technology? How many of our countries have an easily accessible facility, a dedicated facility, which we as young people can tap into to support the conversion of these ideas into sustainable livelihoods? This is why we remain relentless in our call to development partners, private sector, government, to scale up investment in youth research and innovation, as well as the provision of technical and financial support for youth-led sustainability efforts. You know, I want to remind you, my fellow young people, that at this stage, we should not see ourselves as merely participants in the development process, but as leaders contributing and driving to the 2030 Agenda. I urge those in power who continue to idle to step up or perhaps be pushed out as young people are able and we have the right to take the keys to drive forward on our route to sustainability. Whilst we do not have much time left to deliver on the global goals, what we do have is a wealth of untapped creativity and potential in this generation and in future generations. I often say that the recipe for successful partnerships for the 24G agenda involves the three Bs. That is, let us break down all barriers which hinder participation of young people, that is from indigenous groups, marginalized communities, you name it. Let us bring forward our solutions, our ideas, and the resources. And thirdly, let us be bold in our efforts and inspire others for action. After all, we cannot do it alone. Just as climate change has taken over and altered the way of life of many of us, we should make no apology in taking over the spaces which will influence our future. We can only achieve this together, so let us see young people as the catalysts and the core connectors for achieving a sustainable future for all. I thank you. I thank Mr. Henry for this inspiring statement. Um, and now we are going to take a brief pause um, to allow the podium to be rearranged for a moderated conversation, which will be led by Mr. Sherwin Bryce Peace, who is the Bureau Chief and Correspondent um, of South African Broadcasting Corp of the United Nations, featuring keynote messages from young people around the world. The moderated conversation will be followed by a Young Leaders Spotlight Session on People and Planet, 
Following the spotlight session, the forum will begin part A of its ministerial session and hold its interactive roundtable on working with and for youth in accelerating COVID-19 recovery and achieving the 2030 agenda, which will be moderated by Ms. Jayathma Vikramanayake. I wish you all a very productive discussions. No, take a seat, take a seat. Oh, the space. Yeah. <laughs> Don't be shy about it. How are you, have you just come in from there? Or are you no, I'm based here. I'm based here. So I do a lot of these things for different entities and agencies. Right. Yeah. 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 Press that. All right, we're going to start, folks. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Order in the house, please. I'm going to do this one more time. Please take your seats. We're about to begin, and we need silence in the room. Thank you. Good morning. I said, good morning. 
Say yes if you can hear me. Yes. Say yes if you can hear me. Yes. When we talk about interactive sessions at the United Nations, it's a two-way street, so we both have to work at this together, right? My name is Sherwin Bryce Pease. I'm a journalist uh, for, from South Africa, and I cover the United Nations in New York. Welcome, everybody. So rather than go through the regular platitudes of gaveling this meeting in, which I really try to avoid, but sometimes it's necessary, or welcoming you to this hallowed place using words like your excellency this and your excellency that, I thought why not give the start to this EcoSoc Youth Forum a different flavor, particularly because we are in a room filled with very dynamic people who have a very clear vision of the world they want. Am I right? Am I right? Yes. The theme of this year's Youth Forum is accelerating the COVID-19 recovery and full implementation of the 2030 Agenda with and for the youth. 24 words which mean a whole bunch of things that are often very complex to build consensus around. A world facing multiple cascading crises, including a cost of living challenge, conflicts and cli a climate emergency, that cares little for your politics or your station in life. According to the International Labour Organization, young people face severe difficulties in finding and keeping decent employment. This 15 to 24 year old demographic is increasingly frustrated with the slow progress the world, and by that I mean the adults in the room, is making in terms of implementing the 17 Sustainable Development Goals or resolving the three C's I just mentioned. Cost of living challenge, conflicts, climate emergency. So while this forum, this moment here today, is an opportunity to be heard, to add your voices to the solutions we all seek, to discuss your role in resolving the climate crisis, in ending wars, and building resilient societies, this has to increasingly be a debate about the power of young people and how they intend to wield that power towards the creation and retention of sustainable societies. If you are increasingly frustrated about the slow pace of change, then I have a few quotes for you. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but he must take it because conscience tells him it is right. You can read he as she and she as he in that context. My former and late president Nelson Mandela said, sometimes it falls upon a generation to be great. You can be that generation. Michelle Obama said, it's easy to look at what your predecessors have done and say, not enough, why not better, why not bigger? And what I say is young people aren't wrong to feel that, but in the meantime, what I'd urge young people to do is to be rageful and own it, but have a plan, says Michelle Obama. So I put it to you, the brilliant youth of this generation, that this is your time. That this is your time to take power if you find that those with it are fiddling while your planet burns. Think about it. In many countries around the world, if just the youth turn out to vote, if that collective showed up, you can literally change the outcome of elections and better shape the future that everybody wants. Why wait for a bloody revolution when the ballot box often is all the revolution you need? So my message here is this, let them hear you. The Secretary General and the Deputy Secretary General could not join us today, but they will hear us. Let's begin by letting all the powerful people in this building, in this building here today, hear us. All the way up to the 38th floor, I want them to know that the Youth Forum is officially underway here at United Nations headquarters in New York. Can you help me do that? Can you help me do that? So I'm going to say, are you ready to get to work? And then you're going to say, yes, we are. I'm going to say, are you ready to get to work? And you're going to say, I need you to be louder. They can't hear you on 38. I'm going to say, are you ready to engage and find solutions that ensures the full implementation of the SDGs? And you're going to say, yes, we are. So let's try this. Are you ready to get to work? Yes, we are. Louder. Yes. Are you get ready to get to work? Are you ready to engage and find solutions and ensure the full implementation of the SDGs? Yes, we are. So welcome to the 2023 ECOSOC Youth Forum. Let them hear you. <laughs> All right.
right, that's how you start a meeting at the UN, don't you think? Thank you, thank you. All right, sorry, almost tripped over over there. So we have six speakers in this segment, and I'll introduce each of them when I pose questions to them directly. You are welcome to read their full biographies online because my introductions will be quite concise in order to maximize our time together. And they're to my right. I'm going to start with Achim Steiner. Uh, I had the privilege of interacting with him uh, over the years, a true brains trust at the United Nations, a great communicator who also happens to be the administrator of the UN Development Program and vice chair of the UN Sustainable Development Group. Welcome, Achim Steiner. Akim, how would you define meaningful youth engagement in the context of sustainable development? Right, there sure. we are. Thank you, Sherwin, and good morning, first of all, to um, this wonderful panel that I'm very privileged and honored to join, and good morning to all of you. And um, what fun to see a room come alive like you're making it come alive this morning. So thank you, Sherwin. Very quickly, um, my own journey of Understanding, first of all, of how you move from youth to um, where I am today is obviously one of leaving one group and joining another and being seen precisely as such, even though you want to hang on to being the former. So sometimes when I sit here, and particularly when I meet with young leaders, the temptation is to think that we are actually in the same group, but we're not. Clearly, to many of you, when you walk into this building here, power is a very distant phenomenon. And I first of all want to salute all of you who have come and who have made time to make this youth forum come alive in the United Nations. And as Sherwin said, oddly enough, this building can actually listen very carefully. And much of what happens in this building, oddly enough, is also listening to one another. So first of all, thank you for taking the time to be here. My own journey also in understanding how in an institution such as the United Nations or the institution that I now have the privilege of leading, the United Nations Development Program, was to understand when young people said, don't talk about us as if we are tomorrow's people. We are actually here right now and stop treating us as something hypothetical, but take us seriously. And if you do that, you begin to realize we're not tomorrow's leaders, we're actually today's leaders. And we want to be not only heard, we want to have a seat at the table. Now, in the work of the United Nations Development Program, we don't spend a lot of time in conference rooms generally because we work where many of you live, where you are at home across the world in 170 countries. So the second challenge becomes one of, well, how do you go beyond inviting young people, listening to them, um, helping them shape perhaps your thinking in a particular country program for a project or an issue such as climate change? And we have taken a number of very deliberate steps which is also to learn that it's not just a listening exercise because that immediately makes you into a passive actor in our universe. So a couple of years ago, we invested in establishing something called the Accelerator Labs in UNDP. In over 100 countries now, there are teams of people whose only task is to go out and find you. Find people who are actually finding solutions to your communities, your countries, particular challenges, who are innovators across the full spectrum. It can be techies, it can be social movements, it can be environmental science, it can be land use management, it can be a question about mobility in your neighborhood, or indeed recycling and waste management. All of this is really the front line of development innovation, and in UNDP we have made a very deliberate effort to try and create precisely the means by which we can connect to those of you who are already leading the change. And then ask ourselves, what can we then do as UNDP to help a government better understand it, to rethink our own programs, to attract financing, to help change legislation? And those are then the steps that suddenly turn the relationship between young people and UNDP, their community, their government, into, let's say, a somewhat more equitable relationship. And we start co-creating. In Africa, some of you, and yesterday Isadora and I were already in a meeting with some of you who are here in this room today, we spoke about Youth Connect in Africa. It's a movement that began out of Rwanda that UNDP was very privileged to support from the beginning. Today it attracts 10,000 young leaders from across Africa. It continues to grow. It's another way in which, for example, presidents now sit in a room and listen for hours to what you as young leaders and doers are actually communicating. 
Last, let me end because I know, Shevin, we are in, in a rush as always here. Let me also say to you, um, yes, there is a lot of talking in these halls. There are summits. There are documents. They are the patient journey of 8 billion people trying to understand why they actually need each other despite all their differences, despite all the scars that they have about history, about the present. When you look to this autumn and you see an SDG summit happening here, I hope many of you in this room here will not fall into the easy way, which is to criticize all those around the world who didn't meet the targets and indicators. But more importantly, you will actually see why the goals matter. And I know you do, otherwise you probably wouldn't be here, but that's not enough. We need to convince the world out there that the Sustainable Development Goals aren't just some aspirational statement. They are perhaps the smartest tool that we have to be able to continue to think together, act together, and see one another in a world that is so preoccupied with basically pointing fingers at others and perhaps away from oneself. So in that spirit, let me just say, I feel very privileged to be here amongst you this morning. Thank Hakim, you. you're right. We're, we're always in a rush, but we're in a rush to implement the SDGs. And I think you touch on a very important point, right? Uh, progress has been slow, but the world is distracted, right? Uh, if we talk about silencing the guns, if you look at uh, protracted conflicts or new conflicts, just think about the situation in Sudan. When you are focused on conflict, when you are focused on funneling weapons to actors on the ground, you are therefore not focused on climate change. You're not focused on ending poverty, on no food, on quality education and quality health care so on. So how do you take, take the people in this room to make those changes fundamental on the ground so that we can focus on what really matters? And that's the 2015 blueprint that member states signed on to called the Sustainable Development Goals. We need to implement those goals. The blueprint exists. It's implementation that's the key. And we're distracted right now, are we not? We are distracted. We are being distracted. Let's be honest, there's a lot of politics involved in trying to basically focus on conflict rather than cooperation. And, you know, the institution that I lead and the UN development system that we are part of is in many ways a direct challenge to that. I want you to think of the development agenda, the sustainable development agenda, the SDGs, as essentially a challenge to those who think that taking up arms against each other, going to the battlefield, or indeed declaring the other the enemy, will not take us anywhere. Okay. So yes, we are in a sense under a lot of pressure. And you know, yesterday, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute published the latest figures. Two trillion, I think $2.25 trillion spent in 2022 on essentially military hardware, personnel, defense. Look at how we are struggling to invest in development. It is an absurd equation that we are currently transacting for the world. And therefore, I would argue we are, in fact, a challenge to those who want to distract from the realities on this planet. Mm. The development agenda is, in fact, a direct challenge to those who think that you can put the SDGs aside and find another way of conducting international relations. So for that reason alone, every day across the world, we are advocating for a different way of thinking about development. It is about how we co-invest in one another. And above all, it is also to recognize in every one of your communities, in every one of your countries, I challenge you to actually tell me that you cannot find an example of an extraordinary implementation of an SDG. Everywhere I have traveled, I have seen extraordinary things happen. Yes, the statistics, when you add them all up, divide them by 193 countries, is not pretty right now. But that should not hide the fact that amongst your communities, your networks, there are amazing people doing extraordinary things every day. Our role as UNDP is to find them, to assist them, to be by their side, and to help them change the tides that are currently taking us in a very different direction. Akim, I think you're such a wonderful resource to this uh, institution. Thanks for spending some time with us. I know you have to rush off to another Not meeting. Yet. So <laughs> we thank Akim Steiner for his uh, interventions this morning. Zimbabwe's Chantal Marakera is a 2018 Millennium Fellow, a Rhodes Scholar, and the founder of Little Dreamers Foundation that provides access to education for low-income children in Zimbabwe while focusing on issues of women's empowerment. Uh, Chantal, what is the role of young people in creating local solutions to achieve the SDGs to rebuild the global economy, particularly in the aftermath of COVID-19? Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, for such uh, an important question. It is an incredible honor to be among a panel of such distinguished leaders who are working day and night to make a difference in their communities. I'd like to first of all start by paying tribute to all the youth across the front lines who are driving innovative change to build a sustainable and 
future-focused economy, who sadly could not be here due to multiple structural barriers that continue to hinder the advocacy and engagement of young people, it is my hope that this morning I can use this platform to amplify their voices, even though they are not in this room. Young people have inherited so many complex challenges. Without much of a choice, they came into a broken world where there is global warming, food insecurity, wars and military conflicts. They are all just the talk of the day. Yet in spite of this heavy hand that young people have been dealt with, they are working tirelessly at the front lines, driving efforts towards job creation, infrastructure development, they are leveraging and harnessing digital technologies for social inclusion. They are challenging power imbalances and creating a paradigm shift towards a fair, inclusive, and resilient recovery. They refuse to be defined by their circumstances, but rather they are charting their own course to leave the world a better place. A few days ago, I had the pleasure to meet an incredibly strong, young black New Yorker, Suzette who in spite of having been diagnosed with breast cancer, she's leveraging the power of social media and stand-up comedy to raise awareness about breast cancer and health disparities for black women. In the Generation Equality Youth Task Force, I see a lot of young people who are working towards the SDGs. For example, Karen, who is dedicating her life to peace building, conflict prevention, and transformation by mobilizing grassroots women in war-torn areas in Cameroon to organize for peace and nonviolent resolution. In the Millennium Fellowship, I see a lot of talented fellows like Hanin, Miza, and Sali who traveled to rural regions in Yemen to conduct examinations, treat infected cases, and conduct health education to prevent malaria. So Mr. Bryce, to answer your question, I'll say, young people are here and they indeed mean business. They will not stop until they've completely rebuilt the socio-economic and political fabrics of society. So young people are here and they are working towards the SDGs and they will not stop until we see meaningful and concrete change. Thank you. So young people are here and they mean business. Do you agree? Yes. I, I can't hear you. Yes. Do you agree that young people are here and they mean business? Yes, we are. Thank you. Uh, Chantal, I'll come back to you in just a moment. My Sami Ahmed is from Bangladesh and an Advocacy Officer Fellow from Save the Children and a Next Generation Fellow at the UN Foundation. What are the most effective mechanisms for engaging children in all their diversity in, implementation, uh, in implementing the SDGs? Uh, thank you, Sharon. Um, I'm from Egypt. <laughs> oh. My so, this is so exciting. It's my first time at the ECOSAC Youth Forum, and it's happening uh, in a hybrid mood after the pandemic. Uh, back to the question. It's a really great uh, question. Uh, my experience working with the children from disadvantaged backgrounds made me realize that children know what they want, and they can express themselves like no one can. Unfortunately, effective mechanisms for meaningful child participation in the SDGs implementation are few and far between. To be clear, by, child, by children here, I'm referring to anyone under the age of 18. This definition set out in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. The CRC was a historic moment when the multilateral system united for children and their future. It was a groundbreaking as it contributed to the global transformation in how children are viewed, including their status and their rights. This includes acknowledging children as agents in their own right and recognizing children's rights to participate in decision-making that impact their lives. Moreover, Agenda 2030 recognized the children as agents of a change and it also recognized their activism to sustainable development, which continues well beyond 2030. Many of the children committed to delivering the 2030 agenda will be mothers, fathers, and grandmothers and fathers by 20, uh, 2100. However, the growing scope of children's activism has yet to reach the walls of the UN. Children constitute more than 30% of the world population, yet, their participation is still very much ad hoc. Hearing from children, hearing what they want and what they need will help us recognize their potential and will help us leave no one behind. Um, 
there is, there is, there is a growing, increasing uh, opportunities for youth engagement, but there are few formal avenues to support the children's participation at the UN. The ECOSAC Youth Forum, for example, uh, is limited to youth engagement. However, there is no similar mechanism for children uh, to support their meaningful participation. This does not mean that we aim to create like a parallel system for meaningful child participation. Organizations such as my own have been working to support the children meaningful participation in several UN processes, including the UNCRC reporting and most recently child-led voluntary national review reporting. For example, in 2020 in Zambia, a child-led uh, uh, voluntary uh, national review was presented by a child uh, researcher with a formal uh, delegation. Also, there is uh, many opportunities where children have been supported to participate. For example, the major group for children and youth, which is one formal platform for children and young people to engage with the UN on the sustainable development. However, such mechanism lack, uh, faces a lot of like, uh, barriers, such as lack of funding and other administrati administrative and political barriers. Hence, it's really important to engage to coalitions and networks that reach, reach children and young people, such as Unlock the Future Coalition, which is committed to unlock financing for young people. Also, there were, there were some moments where a children was prefers to the UN Security Councils who have shared their experience of living in conflict settings as part of the Council's Children and Armed Conflict Agenda. So, I would like to share some suggestions to have more meaningful child engagement and uphold the right to participate. We need to make these informal processes formalized and institutionalized through supporting more child-led uh, complementary reporting and ensuring children are consulted in the development of country-led VNRs. Also strengthening the legal and policy frameworks at all levels in the UN and developing a system-wide policy on a child participation and practical guidelines. Finally, I think states UN bodies, civil societies should develop partnerships with the children that empower and involve them as an equal partner in shaping policies and decisions affecting them and the future generations. Uh, just like we were discussing, we are not tomorrow leaders, we are today's leaders and children are the future leaders. So, thank you, Chairman. My Sami, my apologies there from Egypt. Thank you. And I think, you know, you make a point, you talk about financing and the need for financing, and I think when you talk about power and taking power, you need money to back you when you want to take yeah. power. So we can come back to you in just a moment. Jishen Liu uh, is the founder of Clear Plate, an AI-based app that rewards people for not wasting food. He was also named among the 2020 Young Leaders for the SDGs. As a social entrepreneur, how do you see young people contributing to the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals while still recovering from COVID-19 and addressing particularly the impacts of climate change? Firstly, thank you for having me here. It's such an honor for me to join this discussion. So from my perspective, I think young people are critical stakeholders with at least five roles that can be played in achieving the global Sustainable Development Goals. That is critical thinkers, innovators, communicators, change makers, and leaders for now and for tomorrow. So as a social entrepreneur, I want to specifically pursue the role as change makers, because I think making change is actually not far from our daily life, because it's not a professional skill, but a mode of thinking, a sense of discovering and solving social problems. I believe young people can make change, especially by raising awareness and educating others about the SDGs, Global Development Initiative and Climate Change, using their creativity, their skills, their platforms to educate others and inspire actions and behavior change. So let me just give uh, one example of myself. In 2018, I founded ClearPlate app, aims to reduce food waste. Right now, we have nearly 10 million users uh, in the past five years. Actually, this app was inspired by a restaurant where they provide some kind of cards 
to record the times of customers who reduce their food waste. And uh, they will reward customers with some free dish. And this just inspired me. And I think such incentive can be uh, amplified through internet mobile application. So I developed ClearPlate app. So on this app, people will take a picture of the plate after a meal. And uh, we have AI algorithm to identify whether waste or not. And once finished food without waste, the users can get credits, which can be used to redeem gifts or make donations to charity meals. So our mission is to inspire and empower everyone to take actions against food waste. Even during the pandemic, our user base has been fast growing. So I think uh, right now, uh, it's, it's, it's crucial for us to inspire youth actions and really to empower them to build some connections, to uh, make connections, contributions to the SDGs. So you can see, sometimes the trigger to be a change maker uh, can be quite small. Problem is also a chance where we can make change happen. Where there are social problems, there can be such social enterprise that use commercial ways to solve social problems and to achieve both righteousness and profit. But even though young people are innovative, we have to admit that young people may also face many barriers. For example, we may lack access to quality education, decent work, investment, social protection, or civic participation. So that's why we need framework like UN Youth Strategy and the Global Development Initiative. So, so as to make sure our young people's rights are fully realized, so as to enhance young people's role in the post-pandemic recovery. Thank you so much. Just fascinating, I mean, what you've done uh, with artificial intelligence, and I think that always has to be part of the conversation when you talk about youth and the SDGs. What is the role of tech, right? Artificial intelligence is a big uh, conversation around the world, uh, and young people are better at tech than some of us, right? And I think that could be catalytic in what it is you want to achieve. I'm coming back to you, sir, in just a moment. Laura Locke, a British and Hungarian student who is also the president of the Cambridge Climate Society and an advocate for youth engagement and climate education, among other talents. Please tell me you're from Britain. Uh, British and Hungarian. All right, great. Uh, what did the COVID-19 pandemic teach us about responding to global crises and the impacts they can have on young people in particular? How is this applicable to issues such as climate change? Please Thank answer you. and tell mom we say hi. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I'm honoured to be here today speaking on behalf of the major group for children and youth who've been working alongside UN agencies to deliver this forum. Um, I think the key thing that COVID-19 demonstrated is that modern issues today fundamentally interact and intersect with one another, hitting the most vulnerable populations and communities the hardest. During COVID, we saw this from vaccine nationalism, from racist travel policies and visa laws. COVID showed us that our international political and economic systems do not exist and have not existed to serve everyone. And so I think this is the intersectionality that's absolutely crucial when we're looking at responding to the climate crisis. Because if we're co-organizing things from a siloed perspective, and we're trying to isolate issues of climate from issues of gender or race or social or intergenerational injustice, then we're reinforcing these same violent and problematic power dynamics that have created the very problems that we're trying to solve. And so when, this looks at, and when we look at how this applies to young people, I think we have to recognize that the voices of young people cannot be limited just to our youth. We are activists and peace builders and educators and community members and community leaders. And as many of the panelists have pointed out, we have just as much stake in organizing our present and just as much expertise as we do in organizing our future. And that has to be taken seriously. I think in a more positive light, COVID showed us that we do know how to make change. We have the answers, we just don't yet have the political will to realize them. And we've got opportunities for turning points just as much as we have the dangers of tipping points. I mean, coming up in COP28, we're seeing the conclusion of the first global stock take, which is essentially an opportunity to assess how much progress we've made since the Paris Agreement. And it's an opportunity to question what we're doing wrong, what we could do better, and how we can strengthen the rights-based engagement to create these best practices for knowledge exchange and for growth and capacity building. I think it's undeniable that we're faced with existential threats, we're faced with increasing inequity, and that is precisely why young people have to be structurally and systemically integrated into the achievement of SDGs. 
not just on that agenda, but beyond it, to develop equity and justice in the most vulnerable communities, in the frontline communities, and throughout global youth. And that demands that we have the courage and we develop the capacity to respond to, yes, the symptoms of climate change, but also and ultimately its root causes. Thank you. Yeah, I like what you say about the, the lack of political will, right? And I think it goes back to the point about power. If you want to create the political will, I think it's also going to be up to the people in this room. I'll come back to you, Laura, in just a moment. Chile's Isadora Guzman Silva is a young leader for the SDGs and the founder of Ensuetra to Lugar, uh, which works to help people with disabilities find inclusion. Your organization promotes inclusion and gender equality for young people living with disabilities. What are the critical issues that need to be addressed to offer more opportunities for young people with disabilities to contribute to the success of the SDGs? Well, in first place, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I want to start talking about what Encuentra Tu Lugar, or Find Your Place in English, as organization lead by, by youth people does. We try to democratize inclusion, and in terms of that, it's crucial to see which problems for the SDGs are happening, because we know that disability is a collective, but if you see, inclusion is the key for achieve SDGs, because if, if we don't have work, if we don't have education, if we don't have health for everyone, we are not doing our best and we are leaving behind a lot of people, the 15% of population. Even I can say that in my country, just uh, the 50% of the population with disabilities have finished school, and just 0.98% of people have now a work. So we have to work for the SDGs to be inclusive, because with inclusion, we are going to achieve that our goals are going to be submitted finally by the global community. That's why we think by inclusion, because inclusion is um, a paradigm that we have to follow in terms of that people must be included in their diversity, in terms of how um, our realities can be submitted. If we didn't concern that, we couldn't work together. So that's why we, we work for the SDG 1, and with poverty, the SDG 4, quality of education, the SDG 5, um, gender Sorry. equality, the SDG uh, 10, reducing inequalities, the SDG 11, for uh, communities and accessibility, the SDG 17, for partnership, because we believe that these are the keys for achieve sustainable development and no one should be left behind. So that's it. I love how you've got all 17 on your fingertips. Isn't that amazing? And, and I think the point you make about inclusion. Thank you so much. Inclusion being key, the SDGs provide for that inclusion. If you deal with poverty, you include people. If you deal with climate change, you include people. If you're empowering women and gender equality, you're including those people. Because if you're hungry, you're certainly not going to be concerned about implementing the SDGs. What I want to do is go rapid fire. One more question, each for each panelist. You've got one minute to answer because we're running out of time. Chantal, based on your work with Little Dreamers Foundation and the Generation Equality Youth Task Force, what is the greatest hindrance faced by youth activists in their advocacy for the SDGs? 60 seconds, start now. Well, um, two years ago, I addressed some of the member states in this room at the Generation Equality Forum in France, and I spoke to you member states as a youth representative demanding accountability, so you stopped talking and instead started to walk the talk. So today, we are at a critical inflection point, and, at the, and that same demand from two years ago has only become more compelling. We are only a few years ago from 2030, and the 2030 agenda will not become a reality at the current pace of progress. Youth advocates, especially those from developing countries, are still facing insurmountable structural barriers and exclusions when it comes to policy discussions on issues that impact them the most. Tokenism is still a big issue. Lack of funding is still a big issue. Abuse in policy and advocacy spaces is still a big issue. Even access to policy and advocacy spaces remains an issue. So any member states in this room, can you please raise your hands real quickly, limited time. Raise your hands, member states. <laughs> Thank you. Any private sector organizations in this room, can you please raise your hand? Thank you. 
Any philanthropies in the room? Any philanthropies? Okay. <laughs> so now, I'm speaking to you member states directly. I'm speaking to you private sector organizations. I'm speaking to you UN agencies, and I'm speaking to you philanthropies who may not be in the room but are watching online. Could it be that youth are simply at the footnote of, at the bottom of the page? Could it be that you really don't care about, about the youth? I'd like to believe not. Yet here we are reiterating, re reiterating the same things we've been asking for for as long as I can remember. I believe it's a common view among policymakers because if there wasn't, this forum wouldn't exist. Right. So I'm challenging you to create an, an enabling environment that allows young people to be equal partners in the quest to rebuild economies and stimulate equitable and inclusive growth. Thank you, Chantel. One last thing. Go. Yes. <laughs> okay. Taking yeah. power. Taking power. I love no. it. <laughs> As youth, we are saying this is our space and we, we are going to say all the things that we need to say. So real quickly... I'm saying today that we need youth as equal partners for the successful implementation of the 2030 Agenda for the Sustainable Development. And for that to happen, we need to move from speeches and policy briefs to tangible action. Mm -hmm. We need to move from just coming to the Ecosoc Forum once a year and then we just talk about issues and leave. To the young people today, before I leave, I want to pose one question. Are you willing and able to end poverty, eliminate gender equality, promote decent work, create sustainable our communities and strong institutions by 2030. To young people in the room, if you are with me, please say yes. yes. Young people, are you willing to get your hands dirty and to put in the work? Yes. In Zimbabwe, we say eh -he. Are you all ready to get the work started, young people? Yes. Say eh -he. Yes. Young people, are you ready to put in the work? Yes. Amazing. Let's get the forum started. Thank you. My Sami Ahmed, uh, one last comment from you. Address the lack of funding opportunities, uh, opportunities for meaningful child participation in UN processes and how can this be resolved in 60 seconds? Thank you, Trevin. And thank you, Chantal. We are ready, but we need more funding opportunities. So the lack of funding opportunities for meaningful child participation in uh, the UN is a significant barrier to ensure that the children, voices, and perspective are heard in decision-making processes that affect their lives. And to address this issue, there are several potential solutions that save the children and unlock the future coalition identified. One obvious one is to provide more flexible and nimble funding for child participation at the UN. This can be done through increased government contribution, private donations, and partnerships with charitable organizations. Another one is to prioritize the child participation in the UN and ensure that funding is allocated specifically for this purpose. This could involve creating a special fund or grant program dedicated to child participation. Also engaging in partnerships between the UN, civil society, and other stakeholders can be utilized to pool resources and maximize the impact of funding for child participation at the UN. These partnerships can also provide opportunities for capacity building and knowledge sharing to drive intergenerational dialogue and action, which can enhance the effectiveness of a child participation initiatives. Technology also can be used to facilitate child participation in the UN, even when funding is limited, but it should not replace opportunities for in-person participation. Overall, addressing the funding challenges will require a multifaceted approach but it's worthwhile. By investing in meaningful child participation, we can ensure that the children contribute to decision-making processes that will affect their lives and those of future generations and promote a more inclusive and equitable society. Uh, I think what we just need is to always remind ourselves and remember that the decisions we make now will have a direct impact on our children of today and our future generations. Thank you. Thank you, my Sami Ahmed. Back to China's Jishin Liu. Uh, what advice would you give to other young people who are interested in social entrepreneurship but are uncertain about where and how to start? 60 seconds if you can. Okay. Uh, social entrepreneurship can be quite rewarding but can also be quite challenging. So my advice is, firstly, you can start with 
having a clear vision and mission for what you want to achieve. So that way is identifying problems that you are passionate about and research the root causes, the existing solutions, and the gaps or opportunities for improvement. Next step is to test your ideal solution with your target beneficiaries or customers and get feedback from them. And you should also not forget to seek out mentors, peers, partners, and other organizations who can support you, guide you, and collaborate with you along your journey. For example, I have been supported by UNDP's Youth Collab Network and also got funding from the United Nations World Food Program. So we should remember, since we are doing, doing something good, don't forget, we, we can seek help from international, regional, as well as local levels. Final suggestion, keep yourself resilient and optimistic, but also realistic and humble, because social entrepreneurship is not easy. It takes time and effort to really make a difference. So I want to uh, end with Mr. Secretary Guterres' voice. That is, the world depends on youth to continue advocating and pushing for a better world for all. I think we all have a role to play, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. thanks. Thank you. And, and, and I think also important, use an opportunity that this forum presents to network, right? I think network is, is important and collaborations will come from that. Laura Locke, what are the radical changes that could be advanced for our international political system to be more fit for purpose in supporting young people's desire for more participation in decision making? 60 seconds. That would be very difficult to answer in 60 seconds, but I'll 70 do 70 seconds. Thank you. Um, there's obviously a very long way to go for structuring and facilitating youth engagement in international processes, and the lack of youth engagement is fundamentally undermining our ability to achieve the SDG agenda. I think we have to as well recognize that the barriers to youth engagement are incredibly contextual. The barriers facing young people in Europe are gonna be entirely different to the barriers facing young people in Latin America or Southeast Asia. So we have to be very intentional about moving away from these sort of reductionist and universalist narratives to identify local solutions that actually work. If we're looking at making our political systems better now and in the future, we have to understand why they've gone wrong in the past. And we have to be responsible for that and we have to take account for that. And to the member states that are here today, we are watching you and we are watching to see if you do that. Practically, I think it means funding. As everyone has pointed out, it means accessible and intersectional education. It means deconstructing and unlearning and then rebuilding. Mm. To the one philanthropy organization that raised their hand in the room, um, less than 1% of global climate philanthropic funding goes to youth organizations. And of that, only a fraction is reaching the front lines. At the same time, less than 3% of parliamentarians globally are young people. Participating in meaningful decision-making about the world that we live in should not be a privilege. That is something that anybody should be able to access and they should have the support to access it. Leaving no one behind absolutely means young people in the international political systems, but it also means financial and instrumental support for local and regional initiatives to channel that grassroots into these systems. There's a massive difference, sorry, I will wrap up. Okay. Um, there is a massive difference between getting young people into a room and getting young people into a room with the skills and the support and the training to critically engage and best represent themselves. Our needs and our demands are not identical. Youth are not a homogenous group, yeah. and that has to be taken account for. Finally, I think it's just recognizing that there is so much that we are already working towards. We need engagement beyond policymaking, beyond the SDG agenda, in our communities, in our schools, and our universities, and our workplaces, because we really cannot compromise on justice for youth engagement. Thank you. Let me remind you, Laura, you're in charge here, not me. I'm just a moderator. And I think a theme is emerging here, that finance, right? Finance is a very big uh, impediment uh, to achieving what the youth desire and want to achieve. So putting money where your mouth is, philanthropy, one philanthropist in the room, thank you so much in advance. Finally, Isadora guzman Silva. final question to you. What is the one major challenge that you have faced in your journey, and how did you manage to overcome it? Also, how can young people and others address the different issues in an intersectional way? 75 seconds. Now you'll see why inclusion is important. The most or the bigger uh, challenge that I faced through was to suffer exclusion because of my disability. At 
12, I have to be at my house around six months because any school at Chile wants to accept me because of my disability. That's the bigger one in terms of my life. But in terms of activism, I could say that adultism is the bigger challenge because truth uh, for all people, it's like people over 20, over 25, but no people under 18. So they believe that we just want to play and think about our interest. But the thing that we want to do is to change the world. So that's one of the main challenges in terms of activism. Now talking about intersectionality, what is intersectionality? I know that most of you know that concept, but what about other people? Intersectionality is to recognize that the barriers that we are facing through are based in our context, in our gender, in our race, in our disability or not, so we can face exclusion or discrimination if we had these uh, aspects in our life. So in terms of that, why intersectionality is important to make a change? It's because if we work through intersectionality, we can see other realities. We can do partnership, but real partnership, thinking that women are not just white women. Women are black, women have a disability, women are indigenous or young people also. So it's the key because we have to acknowledge that our world is diverse and that's why we have to work by intersectionality. But please, listen to us because we want to do a lot of things but if you haven't give us the space to work with you as partners this could be impossible thank you and on that powerful note is how we conclude this interactive session let's give it up for the six panelists including akim steiner who was with us earlier fantastic interventions thank you and all that's left for me to say is, is good luck in your deliberations over the next few days. And it's now time to move to the spotlight session. Thanks, everybody. I'll do it. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. 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 Okay, but can we also have someone like 
Hello. We are moving on to the next session. So, pleading with everyone to have a seat. Can everyone please have a seat while we move on to the next session? Great. Thank you. Please have a seat while we move on to the next session. And we'll try to keep it on time. Please have a seat. Please have a seat. We move on to the spotlight session. Focusing on people and planet. Great. Please grab a seat and let's get started. We have four amazing SDG young leaders who are here with us today. And they'll be telling us about the state of the planet, the state of human society, the climate crisis, the environmental crisis, injustices, social inequalities and the intersection between these issues we have now. And I'm gonna give the microphone to them soon, just making sure that everyone have gotten him or herself themselves a seat and ready to listen to the spotlight session on people and planet. All right, great, thank you very much. And pass it over to Karen and her colleagues while they take us away, thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Karen Wang Hanyuan. I'm from China. It's such a great pleasure and honor to be here uh, on the People and the Planet session. Uh, everyone in the spotlight, just not just us. Um, so it's a tremendous topic. Like we are really at a special moment after three years, uh, like pandemic happened with almost 7% of the uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction but the compromise, we all know, we all paid for it. So we're here today, uh, along with me, um, the SDG Young Leaders recognized by UN. Uh, we have Addy, Kermit, Gibson, uh, and myself. Our world is really full of different sorts of distractions, not just for climate, but taking out of our tensions. Yet, admit it or not, we are really at this special moment that we have like seven more years to go uh, until 2030. Um, but look at where we are. The recent IPCC report underscores the, uh, the need for immediate large scale actions to mitigate climate change and adapt to its impact. I personally had the pleasure, a pleasure to work in climate through research at Imperial College uh, and also my startup, Climate. We are using the AI technologies to help people to access the uh, among like large amount of information in the climate sector uh, and then to understand to measure the problem better. Through the past couple of years, we've been aware like climate change is really touching on each sector of our life and the work. And the importance of youth leadership cannot be, and cannot be uh, under, understated. We are the future stakeholders, we are the future consumers and we are the future decision makers. So I'm, all, I'm really glad like we're all here. Uh, and then most importantly, we have much more people, young people on the planet who is not able to make it here, but hopefully they're with us. So for our generation, we process the creativity, resilience, and then determination requires transformation change. And today the spotlight session is really to give um, a few examples of the work we've been working on. Uh, but more than that, I hope we can, uh, you can join us this journey on the combating climate change. So I give it to Karma to speak about the, her journeys uh, working on the climate change. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Karim Otodebode, and I'm from Hibado, Nigeria. I'm a poet, an education and gender equality activist, and also one of the SDG young leaders recognized by the United Nations. The four of us are here today to talk about the most important thing that we need to act on, which is people and planet. The objective of our spotlight session is that in today's complex world, the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the vulnerability of humanity and prompted us to reevaluate our relationship with nature and also the planet. 
The latest IPCC report, released in March this year, confirmed that human-induced global warming of 1.1 degrees Celsius has led to unprecedented changes in Earth's climate within recent human history, which is signaling a final warning on the climate crisis. We are going to share our stories and also efforts in addressing climate goals across the various sectors. We are going to highlight stories and actions that will foster a more sustainable planet and improve lives for all our people. Over to you, Gibson. Okay, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, ladies and gentlemen at this place. So I'm Gibson Kawago from Tanzania, a climate activist working on recycling and repurposing lithium ion batteries from laptops to create energy storage systems to power up our homes. So uh, I, I will be telling you a story today. I was born in a village where we had no electricity. So we used to travel long distances carrying five to 10 mobile phones, putting them together to send to charging stations. Then the next morning or the next day, we could take them back and use the mobile phones. And at home, we used to light up our homes using kerosene lamps. Our neighbors at least could use diesel generators. Then I was not happy with that situation. And one time, I was showing a video to my sick grandmother about a wedding that took place far in town. And at the middle of the video, the battery got drained. So unfortunately, I had to send it to a charging station the next day. And sad enough, her situation got worse and she passed away. So having that pain and thinking about how many people are facing the same problem out there, I came up with a solution. So when I got to the university, I started collecting laptop batteries, breaking them apart and seeing how much I could create a solution. And finally, I became the founder of WAGA, a company that collects laptop batteries and we process to make lithium ion batteries. So Climate change is a problem that needs all of us join hands and fight against it. So right now, we are replacing the kerosene lamps that we have been using in the past with the lighting that is powered by laptop batteries. And we are now looking forward to start electrifying the motorcycles that also pollute the environment. Because if we don't care right now, 10 years to come, we are all going to see the impacts. Like right now, we see in Tanzania, we have some few problems. There's increase in temperature, there are low tides, and we keep on complaining without thinking we are the ones causing the problems. So as young people right here at this forum, it is our responsibility to join hands together and make sure we act as small as we are. Because see, knowing how to do and doing, we think they are this close, but they are this far apart. Because we all here know how to fight climate crisis. But how many people right here are fighting against it? How many? So I would like to urge you one thing. If we want to unite and fight against climate problem, can we all raise all two hands together up? That we want to fight against climate crisis. When I say, say no to climate crisis, you say, ndio, which means yes in Swahili. So all of you say, ndio. ndio. Say no to climate crisis. Ndio. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gibson, for, for your amazing story. My name is Eddie Fran Vasquez, and coming from Dominican Republic, a small island developing state from the Caribbean. And today I'm talking to you as a climate and ocean activist that has been on this path for the last 10 years. Coming from a small island states, we are facing one of the biggest challenges that none of our previous generation has ever encountered, and it is plastic pollution. This enormous problem um, is affecting our waterways quality, our communities um, life, lifestyles, but it's also creating an enormous, uh, an enormous bargain into us as society and consumers today. It's affecting our human health, but it's also affecting the life of many species that are not related to this issue. To face this problem, Juventud Sostenible, a youth-led organization that was created in 2016 uh, by me and a couple of friends, we started a three-dimensional response in order to beat plastic pollution. 
The first one of these responses was to raise awareness into our community, try to capacity building youth people and uh, making them youth ocean ambassadors. They go house to house every day trying to make a people aware about the plastic pollution and how they can prevent them from their everyday lifestyles. The second dimension is that we are trying to monitor um, plastic debris in our, in our coastline. We are doing it through a, a science-based approach, trying to see the quantities, uses, but also the brands and the responsibles of creating this huge mess in our places. We have done an amazing work for the last four years and we have realized through the different reports that we have made, elaborated amazing policy recommendations to the government in order to prevent this, this challenge. And the third dimension we have been facing is also advocating in public policies. We have um, been working with the government hand to hand in order to see how uh, single use plastic prohibitions and ban can be developed into the countries. And right now we're into that good phase so our people or young people can understand why this problem needs to be addressed. We, as young people, are trailblazers, change makers, and groundblazers. But we need everybody help in order to make this change and to make the work for the SDG agenda, especially for beating plastic pollution possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hedy and Gibson. Um, according to the United Nations and Nigeria, the impact of the climate change has further reinforced the, the, the conflict which has contributed to migration patterns within the country. And this is affecting women and girls most especially. It has also affected various sectors, which include the water resources, energy, infrastructure, urban areas, agriculture, peace and security, as well as political institutions. Dear ministers, member states, young people represented, I am standing here today as a poet and a young leader for the Sustainable Development Goal, whose heart bleeds by the damage that is underway. My solution is increased climate education in an innovative way. I come from Ibadan, or your state, Nigeria, a beautiful city, Asian city, that has often been ravaged by flooding. Lives have been lost. Properties have been destroyed. However, year in, year out, there seems to be no stop in this unfortunate situation. My solution is to propose the use of art and artistic learning to educate the general populace. This should come in accessible multiple formats and channels like poetry, radio dramas, music, comedy in local languages. Where I come from, Aloha Pamo, which is called folklore, is a great way to teach lessons and spread knowledge. Let us go back right in time and use local solutions and human approach to this problem. Let us go back to communities, look at the cultures of these people and incorporate it to solve the problem that is um, ravaging the society at this very moment. We need to take a step backward and go back in time. We are going to take a step towards combating the climate crisis if the people really know what they are fighting for. As a young person and as a poet, I use my heart and my poetry to talk about the climate change. So member states, young leaders, let us go back in time and use local solutions for this problem at this very moment. Thank you. Thank you all. And finally, I want to come back to our topic today, planet and the people. Sustainability in the climate is really about people, ourselves. Um, and then we need to rethink about relationship with our planet. The fact that we've been able to stay here in one table, uh, in one room, is like after a couple of years, like three years after the pandemic, and nobody could imagine like what kind of cost we paid for it. So well, it cannot be more important to emphasize um, a solution is really in our hands, and then it's a decision up to ourselves. We have the solutions, it's just like how we can utilize them, how to drive down the cost, how to reduce the green premium. We have like a satellite which can monetize, which can monetize the planet. Uh, we have the water solutions, we have the uh, plastic solutions. And I believe like all of you uh, has a role to play in your life and the work. Well, 
We had the privilege to be part of the SDG Young Leader cohort at this room, but what we really want to uh, make a call to action uh, is to brought the community to the business, government, civil society, um, to support the youth in the actual actions. And the support can be resource, can be mentorship, can be financing, we discussed, and can be mentoring, uh, and can be like men mental support as well. Well, I want to wrap up with uh, something I took away from uh, Sharma Sheikh uh, at the COP27, it's about implementation. We discuss a lot about climate change, but in the end, it's really just three words. Let's take it like implementation, implementation, and then implementation. So then we hope our future generations can also have the opportunity to stand here as we are today um, and to continue building a different world, a better world we're living on. Thank you so much.